My name is Richard, and I love dinosaurs. <laughs> Growing up in western Pennsylvania, I was the son of a coal miner. And from time to time, he would bring home with him little, little black pieces that, that he had recovered from the mine. And what was special to me was that within these rocks were windows into to lost worlds, ancient worlds. The, the texture of an ancient tree bark or a delicate fern frond, so perfectly preserved, every little detail you could see. And, and as, a, as a child, seeing these pieces, it, it fascinated me. The world was not always like it is today. There was much more to this world than I know. This world is bigger than me. And my parents were very supportive of this interest, as you can see. They were very patient with this interest, as you can imagine. And we would take a trip one time a year, twice a year, three times a year into Pittsburgh to the Carnegie Museum of Natural History, which had one of the great, and still has, one of the great classic dinosaur halls in the world. All of the, the famous dinosaurs that many of us grew up with were there. Allosaurus, Stegosaurus, Diplodocus, Apatosaurus, and then staring straight at you, kind of daring you to enter the space at the end of the gallery, was Tyrannosaurus rex. And it, I was just fascinated, again, the concept that the Earth has changed over time. And there were worlds that I didn't know and I didn't understand really fascinated me. And so I would come home from those trips. I would sit at my desk. And I, I would draw the animals that, that I just saw, sometimes spelling their names correctly, sometimes not, in one instance here. And this continued. This interest never went away. I kept going back to Pittsburgh. I kept going to this dinosaur hall. I kept just standing in the shadows of these great skeletons and marveling up at them. And as time went on, I, I would come back, and I would still draw the dinosaurs. But then I would turn the page, and I would draw a floor plan of what my dinosaur hall would look like. If I was in charge of a museum, how would I lay out these skeletons? And I became fascinated about communicating that science. And, and perhaps some of it was selfish. I wanted to share in the joy of, of watching children walk in and just being amazed by the, these spaces and, and these fossils. And, and I wanted to be a part of that. And so it came time to, to go off to, to college and, and graduate school, and I pursued paleontology as a scientific pursuit. But I'd always had that interest in science education as well. And a unique opportunity came up as I was in graduate school, and that's where I made the decision. Do I continue a path of scientific research, or do I take a slight turn and focus on science education? And that's when I decided to make that turn and focus on science education and, and bringing the nature of science, the results of science, the wonder of science to the non-scientist. So here I am today at the Yale Peabody Museum of Natural History. Very fortunate to be at such an amazing institution. 2016 represents the Peabody's 150th anniversary. And there, it's my pleasure to oversee the education programs, to see the exhibition programs of the museum. So what do we do within those walls? Well, within those walls, within those brick walls of the museum, we tell the 4.5 billion year history of the Earth and its life. At four and a half billion. It's easy to say, we can all say that, but, but I have not yet a human mind that can actually truly comprehend and appreciate just how long that history is and how deep our history is on this planet. So how do we tell those stories? What's the basis for those stories? Well, the basis are the collections of the museum and the collections of all natural history museums. At the Peabody, we have 13 million objects in our collection, A to Z, anthropology to zoology, and many, many disciplines in between. And so why? why? Why do we have 13 million specimens and growing? Well, if you have one of something, if you have a beetle, or you have a bird, or you have a dinosaur bone, 
it has information. It tells you something. But to have 50 beetles, or 500 beetles, or 5,000 beetles, you can begin to start seeing patterns across time and space. And it's those patterns that lead to our understanding of the natural world. And so really, the collections of natural history are truly the foundation for how we perceive and how we understand the world. Ancient fossils tell us about those bygone areas that, that so fascinated me as a kid. They also show us how life is connected, how life has evolved and changed over time, and how organisms are related to each other. These collections tell us about ourselves. They tell us about human culture, us as a species, and how we understand one another. And they tell us about identity. And then they can also tell us about the world today, looking at our collections, looking at plant collections. We see that leafing out times occur more quickly within the year now than they did even 100 years ago. And so when we look at biodiversity loss and we look at climate change that's happening today and will affect us as a species, we look to natural history collections. And so natural history collections, these 13 million objects that we have just in the Peabody, each one of those tells a story. But individually, each one of those is also a puzzle piece. And together, those puzzle pieces paint the larger picture. They show us the larger picture of the Earth and its life and the history of that life and how we as a species fit into that history. And we tell those stories in a number of ways, the written word, the spoken word, but primarily within museums, we use exhibitions. And so exhibitions are essentially storytelling using objects. It's three-dimensional storytelling. So how do we do that? How do we tell stories with, with these objects? It's challenging. We do know that people do learn in museums which is great. However, we also know that people do not come to museums to learn. Museums are leisure-based social venues. And so whenever we start a new project, we start a new exhibition, or, or we start discussing a new program, and say I'm speaking to a, a researcher or a curator who, who hasn't worked on an exhibit before, I always, I always make sure that I let them know this. This is not your museum. These are not your visitors, and this is not you. And I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> so then, how do, we, how do we bridge that gap? How do we take science, the results of science, and how do we present that in a three-dimensional setting to our visitors? Well, there's, there are three personal golden rules that, that I constantly remind myself about. Number one, visitors are people too. Now what do I mean by that? Of course they're people. Well, they're people with their own personal background, with their own story, their own history, their own motivation. Our visitors are not just empty buckets waiting to be filled with information. They're bringing their life experiences and their motivations into the museum. And so it's very important that we recognize that. This is, a, this is the introductory panel of an exhibition that was at the American Museum of Natural History down in New York. And I absolutely adore this panel. So you walk into the exhibition, and this panel is what you see. The exhibition was called Creatures of Light. And that first sentence, have you ever held a glowing firefly in your hands? How many here have done that? And so within five seconds of you entering this exhibition, the exhibition is not something foreign to you. It is now your story as well. And that so successfully hooks the visitor into a scientific concept that's defined at the very end, bioluminescence, that walking into the museum, they, they knew of fireflies, 
they might or might not have known the term bioluminescence, but this exhibition is about that. And again, by opening with that question, that very, very good question that many people can relate to, it makes the exhibition more personal. And it makes the story of the exhibition also the visitor's story. And so visitors are people too. And so we want to connect with people's histories, their experiences, and their motivation. This is another example. I love dinosaurs, as I said. This is the Field Museum in Chicago. And there's an exhibition label on the tail of these long-necked dinosaurs like Brontosaurus, Diplodocus, Apatosaurus. And within the label, it explains how some of these dinosaurs had up to 80 individual vertebrae in their tail, 80 backbones making up their tail. And that's a fun little nugget of information. But very wisely, the very next sentence is you have 33 total in your entire body. So it makes it relatable. It takes this enormous beast that lived 150 million years ago, and it explains its anatomy, but it makes it relatable because it, 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 it connects it to, to your own body. Number two, less is more. This is a gallery on human evolution a very well-researched gallery, a very well-meaning gallery. But as you can see, there is a lot of information. And we know that within a museum setting, visitors, the more investment they perceive in a display, the less they actually invest in the display. It becomes wallpaper, for lack of a better word. By contrast, Here's a wonderful label in Los Angeles at the Natural History Museum. And this is a huge, a huge wall opposite one of these long-necked dinosaurs. And you can see they take a very potentially complicated topic, defining what dinosaurs are, introducing you to dinosaurs. And it's not a wall full of text. It's a single short paragraph. And so, Based on what we know of how visitors move through museums, again, as social venues, a visitor will learn more from this than they will from that. There's more information here, but they will learn more from that. Pairing it down even further with, with less is more, this is a, a, a little flap, a little panel on a hinge in New Mexico at the museum there. The visitor, you walk up to it, you, you grab the little round knob and you pick it up, and that's what you see. <laughs> so it shows two things. Number one, it shows the importance of a hyphen, but number two, it tells visitors in a very memorable, simple way that birds are dinosaurs. Birds are living dinosaurs. And again, it's the simplicity of it less is more that makes it so very, very effective and memorable. Now, a, a common criticism of, of this approach is, oh, you're dumbing it down, you're dumbing it down, you're dumbing it down. It's a term you hear a lot, and as much as I adore that previous label, I dislike the term dumbing down. I think that if you are a scientist or anyone and you say that you're dumbing down the content for the average visitor, number one, it's disrespectful to the visitor. And number two, it actually reflects more on yourself and your inability to communicate what you do. We don't dumb down information in museums if you do it correctly. What we do is we communicate effectively. And to, to have a perception that you must dumb down your content in order to reach your visitors is very, very naive and, and unfortunate. Number three, objects. I, I started this talk with objects, the objects that I had as a child, the objects that we have in museum collections. And the third golden rule of, of mine is that objects rule. We all, most of us, probably all of us right now, are carrying a phone in which all the information we could ever want, and then some, is right there. 
information is available everywhere. But the objects of museums, the objects of our Earth's history, the objects of us and our cultures, those are truly unique and truly special. And so you should always lead with the object. This is a gallery that we recently opened that highlights some of our collections from our anthropology division. And when you scan that, that photograph, what you see are the objects. If you look closely on the ground you can, and on the walls, you can see some of the text and the labels that explain those objects. But first and foremost, what's pulling you into the space, what's igniting your curiosity are those objects. I guarantee you, a kid would never have that reaction reading a label. But to see a nearly 4,000 pound specimen of fluorite will it will generate those kinds of reactions, and those are the reactions that we love in museums. So stepping back and looking at museums in general, in America, museums in America welcome more than 850 million visitors every year. 850 million. That's 70 million per month. That's more than 2 million per day. And so why is that important? Well, museums have a tremendous potential and therefore a very important responsibility to be the communicators of the world in which we live, the explainers of the world in which we live. The average American, there was a study a number, uh, a number of years ago that, that noted that the average American spends about 5% of his or her life in the classroom, only 5%. And we think of the classroom as the place where we took science class and we learned all the science we'll ever need. Well, who's going to take care of that other 95%? Museums do and need to take care of that 95%. We're facing issues of biodiversity loss. We're facing issues with energy. We're facing issues with climate change. Museums can and should, with their collections, which help us understand these issues, fill those needs. So there's three things that I think museums need to do. Number one, provide perspective. The Earth is four and a half billion years old. We're on it for 70 or 80 years. That's, that's kind of, it's, it's, it's just astonishing to think of the, the larger picture that each of us individually is a part of. Number two, Foster appreciation of that history and of that planet and of the planet today. So provide perspective, foster appreciation. And then thirdly, inspire curiosity, which potentially is the most important. Museums are rooted, going back to the Renaissance, in these what were then private collections of art and natural objects. And, and that is natural history. What is natural history is a very common question that, that at least I get. And natural history to me is everything. It is the earth. It is the life on earth. It is the history of that life on earth. And we as a species are a part of that history. And the products of the human species, including artwork, is within that sphere. So everything, including art, is, is part of natural history. So these early collections, these private collections, were known as curiosity cabinets. They inspired curiosity. They were collected because these were curious things. And I think that the greatest thing a museum can do is to, ultimately, for everybody who walks through the doors, inspire curiosity to learn more about their world. Thank you. <laughs>